my bitch face. You pink armor, lipstick rebel, steel-cheeked, slit mouth, head to the ground, mean girl. You headphones in, but no music. You house key turned blade. You quick step between street lights, strainer of pricks and chest beaters. Laughter is a foreign language to your dry ice tongue. Resting bitch face, they call you. But there is nothing restful about you, no. Lips like a flat-lined heartbeat panic at the sight of you, scream for their mothers, throat full of bees, head spun 360, exorcist, bitch. Just trying to buy a soda, just trying to do your laundry, just trying to dance at the party when someone asks you to smile and the blood begins to riot. Smile and you chisel away at your own jaw, smile, and you unleash the swarm into the mouth of a man who wants to swallow you whole. One theory is that you were born like this, but I don't believe it. You came out screaming and alive and look at you now. Look at how you've learned to hide your teeth. What's wrong with your face, bitch? Your face, bitch, what's wrong with it? Bitch face, I don't blame you for taking the iron pipe from their hands and branding yourself with it, for making a flag out of your body bag. Another theory is that you put it on every morning. Screw it tight like a jar of jelly, but I don't believe that either. You woke up like this and have been for years. How can you sleep pretty when there are four locks on the door and the fire escape feels like break-in bait? They will tell you home is safe zone. No. Bitch face is safe zone. Bitch face is home. Bitch face is cutting off the ladder, willing to burn in the apartment if it means he can't get in. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm going to set my timer so I don't go over time. Um, Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I quickly want to sort of say something about all of the women that grace the stage tonight. Um, Sarah, who I just met, um, is a wonderful calming presence and was very nervous to host tonight and I think she's doing incredibly. Can I, yeah. Um, I personally watched Sarah's poems on YouTube before having met her and so that is always an exciting thing. Blythe is someone who I've known for several years who I met when she was a teenager um, and now consider her a friend. One thing I love about Blythe is that She has always been very unapologetically her age, which I mean to say that I met her when I was 17, and when I was 17, I was like such a fucking asshole, like trying to be older than I was, and didn't just let myself be a teenage girl. Um, Ironically now, like I am a teenage girl, but I'm 25, so it's like not impressive. It's actually like slightly pathetic, but anyway. Blythe is someone who I've always admired her willingness to just be who she is all the time. And I think that that is an incredible skill in all people, um, but especially in femme people. Um, So, and Dua, right? (laughs) Fuck. Dua. Uh, Dua I saw at an open mic at the U of M and was absolutely fucking blown away. Um, I could not believe what I had witnessed and was like trying not to be too crazy afterwards, you know? I just like wanted to like, I wish that I could like transmit to her how I was feeling about her, but I couldn't with my words. So I followed her on Instagram, which is like what you do when you can't communicate. And um, her Instagram is like just as incredible. Like the aesthetic, I don't know. It's like a lot of different hues and shades of, of landscapes. I don't know, it's amazing. Um, And her work is amazing. I think we can all attest to that, right? Um, Yeah. Uh, Melissa is my best friend. And I am in awe of her all the time. And also share everything with her. And that is a beautiful thing, to be impressed with people who you also deeply, deeply love. And so, yeah. That's cool. I love you too. Um, All right, so I'm going to read some poems, if that's cool. Uh, right. So the book is largely in chronological order from like the age 13 to 23, um, and a little bit younger than that as well, but mostly it's, it's a story of, of what girlhood means to me, what it means to grow up and become a woman largely in relation to your geographical location. 
um, and the idea of the hometown and how that relates to how we grow and who we become and what friendship means in terms of that too. Um, I think friendship between girls is often very intense and, um, and I think that it can be seen as a bad thing. And I think at one point I saw it as that too. And writing this book helped me understand how that's beautiful and pick those moments out of my life. So uh, this is called Jordan Convinced Me That Pads Are Disgusting. They make your panties smell like dirty bike chains, she said. We were sitting on her mother's plastic-coated floral couch, one of us in a swimsuit, the other sworn to layers. The water was her selling point, and I was terrified of tampons, or rather, terrified of the undiscovered crater, the muscle that holds and pulls and keeps and sheds. She said, I'll do it for you. And yes, we had seen each other naked many times. We had showered together and compared nipples, wished to trade the smalls and bigs of our respective bodies. So it wasn't unnatural, really, when I squatted on the toilet seat and she lay down on the floor like a mechanic investigating the underbelly of a car. <laughs> With plastic syringe in hand, she wedged the packed cotton into me. This is what I saw last before blacking out and collapsing onto the tile. Jordan, blood scholar, in a turquoise bikini, saying, now you are ready to swim. <laughs> that is a true story. A uh, true story. The next time I put a tampon in, I was so, I didn't put a tampon in for about two months after that incident, because I was like, fuck those. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck that was. I was really happy that me and my friend, who's named Jordan in this poem, uh, were able to share that intimate moment, because I loved her. But um, I was not grateful for what had happened. The next time I put a tampon in, I then put another tampon in and realized I may have forgotten to take the other tampon out. And I convinced myself that there was a tampon floating in me somewhere. And I went to my mother, who used to work for Planned Parenthood and does gynecological exams all the time. And I was like, Mom, I think I lost a tampon inside me. And she was like, well, that's anatomically impossible. And I was like, OK, but I had a tampon in, and I put another tampon in. And I took the other tampon out, and only one came out. So I think there's one inside me. And she was like, let me look. And I was like, fuck, is this going to happen every time I have a tampon in? Someone is just going to be up in my pussy every time. And so I lay down on the bathroom floor, and my mom did her shit. And she was like, Olivia, there is no tampon inside you, but I think it's worth letting you know we have the exact same vagina. And I was like, wow, that's incredible. So, you know, <laughs> that happened. All right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is called and now I put tampons actually now I don't use tampons I use a diva cup uh, which is awesome yeah because um, I just prefer to stick my whole fist up inside me every time I need to change some shit you know I don't I like shit to be messy you know I don't I'm not a chill person and I'm now accepting that all right this is called ode to Elise in eighth grade health class she wasn't wrong when she accused me of staring. I was. A profound observation. What are you, gay for me? As if my body could be flipped solely in the wake of her. Some kind of reverse conversion therapy. Which wasn't wrong either. I had never pined so badly for denim to slip down her lower back upon taking a seat. To reveal the fuzz along her spine that which she likely wished to remove, begged her mother for hot wax like we all did, and how I hoped she never would. 
prayed that no boy would call her beast, my secret joy Elise, who melted the tip of her eyeliner pencil and let it sizzle in her tight line. Elise, who gathered six of her friends and threatened to jump me in the alley. Elise, who taught me to bury a lighter in my fist so that if I ever took my shot, at least I wouldn't break my hand on her pretty, pretty face. I just finished the, se uh, the only season of Big Little Lies. Um, it's a show on HBO. Bella. 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 I've been watching it with Huey and Melissa every night, and um, I just decided instead of water tonight, I would drink Chardonnay as an ode to Reese Witherspoon. So that's what I'm doing. Fuck water. I'm acting like this is the only time I've drank wine instead of water. <laughs> oh, God. All right. What else? Um, all right. This is called The First Shave. I am nine, we are bored, and Karen is dying. We drove to Austin that summer, so Sarah's dad, who described Karen as the great and impossible love of his life, who taught us the word lymphoma, and then the concept of the prefix, how it explains where the tumor lives, could say goodbye. The house is a rind spooned out by the onset of death. What's left is a medicine cabinet full of razors, and we are hungry and alone and sitting on the living room floor where the light from a naked window slices the hardwood like melon, brandishes each individual fuzz on my scabbed calf, a field of erect yellow poppies, and we have been alive as girls long enough to know to scowl at this reveal. And what better time than now to practice removal? Once, I watched my mother skin a potato in six perfect strokes. I remember this as Sarah teaches me to prop up my leg on the side of the tub and runs the blade along my thigh. See, she says, isn't that so much better? Before we left Albuquerque, her father warned us she will have no hair a trait we have just begun to admire, except, of course, for the hair he is talking about, that which we hold against our necks, that which will get us husbands or compliments or scouted in a mall, eventually cut off by our envious sisters while we sleep. Um, wow, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right, all right. Um, all right. So the book is split up into four different sections, sort of uh, both, both to imply um, a change in location, but also a sort of change, not necessarily in age particularly, but in phase, I suppose. Uh, so this is the last poem of that section. It's called Liberty. When the blonde counselor showed up at Christian camp, the boys stopped being fun. She arrived, a stack of bubblegum suitcases next to her, one reserved only for her headbands, and the boys stopped mid-dribble. One foot in the river, macaroni necklaces slid off their strings and onto the floor. Rumor was the camp dog only had three legs because a boy swung his gun during rifle practice just to drink a glimpse. We should be te team building, not breaking, she said one evening after canceling Capture the Flag. All of the boys said hallelujah, suggested trust falls. All of the boys held out their hands. I declared war when she banned potato chips. She called for vegetables. The cooks planted a garden. I swore I would find her guilty for something. Cigarettes in her tennis shoes, an expired condom between book pages. I waited for her to pull last night's meal from her throat with the hook of two fingers for two pairs of feet in the shower. But each time I hid in the bathroom stalls and spied, she only flat ironed her hair in thick lemonade chunks. Each time I pretended to sleep, she only whispered to God at the foot of her bed, as creased as a pleated skirt. Each time I followed her to the yard, 
She only raised the flag, watched it float up into the sunrise, a quiet hum of America, the beautiful under her breath, she did not know that when the boys lined up in four straight rows to sing the anthem, they were singing it for her. When they praised the land of purple mountains, of shining seas, when they belted, oh beautiful, it was for her. When they sang America, America, they were calling her name. Thank you. All right. So when I was 10, um, I moved out of New Mexico and I moved to Port of Spain, Trinidad. And I lived there for three years until I was 13. So I left America as a child and came back as a teenager, which was a strange experience um, and something I deeply resented coming back to this country. And uh, I never wrote about it. It just was something that lived with me. and. Um, I got the chance to go back there recently, and it was so amazing because I saw all my friends who live there and who I've kept in contact with for the past 12 years, and I was worried because I didn't know, you know, like I'm a poet and I hang out with poets, so I never know like how I'm gonna be in other social spaces. <laughs> and so I was like, fuck, like what if I don't fit in? And I went and saw these girls who I grew up with, and they were people that I would choose as friends now and any time. And they were just, they're so amazing. And I love them so much. And to know that they have continued to exist there. And I have continued to exist here. And somehow we've grown up to be people that still have that love for one another. Um, <laughs> one of them also was like, do you know you're my first kiss? And I was like, what? And she was like, yeah, we totally made out in your bed when we were like 11. And I was like, no, you were not my first kiss. Um, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, uh, so let's see. I'll read this one. This is called The Only Thing I Brought from America. This is the title poem of the book. The only thing I brought from America are four scabs and a $10 gift card for international phone calls. My father walks me to school every day until he finally buys a 1989 Nissan station wagon with damp seats and an apple cinnamon scented, drinking wine makes you burp, uh, apple cinnamon scented tree that flutters in the rearview mirror. Reina is upset that I am American and not rich. These are two details that disrupt everything Reina has ever been made to believe in the church of MTV, in which she learned that along with a new American best friend, Reina deserves a new American best friend's mom, suburban queen, and a new American's best friend's brother who will take her to second base in our basement. But unfortunately for Reina, we don't have a basement. We live in the Sunset Motel where I collect snails and eat chicken and set can ketchup sandwiches for dinner. Girls don't play sports, the boy says to Reina as he crumples up his sandwich tinfoil into a firm silver ball, except for Olivia, but Olivia is American. Reina whips her neck to glare at me. I am guarding the wicket, ready to bruise whatever the boy throws before she can whisper dyke into the wind. But still, she slips it into my ear and prances back to the shifty-eyed, hairless girls in the corner of the yard, their ring fingers donned in the jeweled promise of their kept bodies. When Reina tells the teacher that I am staring at her in the locker room, I walk to Long Circular Mall and buy a gold plastic rosary from the quarter machine. All of the rich girls wear rosaries. Pull my hair back into a taut bun and polish my calves with my mother's lotion. Reina says I can sit with her at lunch as long as I never play cricket again. I tell her it was just a phase in the way that the motel was a phase. The car and the smell and the hair on my body, all a phase, but the thing about pretending to be rich is you can sculpt the language of money, lie about the helicopter, the vacations, your maid, the way you call her by only her first name. But no matter how many times I speak of Mary, my imaginary helper, I can't spit her out like I would if she were a real woman who dressed me every morning, like Reina, who scowls while she eats hand-rolled dolmas and I haven't played cricket in three weeks. Instead, I take a bite of my mayonnaise sandwich and complain about Mary's cooking while the black top shines and the boys sweat at the other end of the yard. Reina says I am lucky they let me play because the pitcher is the cutest guy in school. 
So she asks, asks if I will teach her the game, and I tell her I don't really know the rules. Americans don't play cricket, I say. I just know how to hit and run, and I know this is the right answer because she repeats it under her breath. Americans don't play cricket. Americans don't play cricket. I don't play cricket because my best friend is American. Better than you, better than your stupid game. All right, uh, okay, we're gonna move on to the next segment of my life then. Um, cool, this is called Backpedal. The boys and I are playing quarters with double shots of vodka and I am winning. By winning, I mean I am not one of the boys, but I am the next best thing. By the next best thing, I mean I am a girl and I am drunk. Every time I make, miss a shot, Johnny gets to flick a quarter against my knuckles, and now my knuckles are bleeding onto my thighs. But every time I make a shot, I get to knock back a throat full of liquor. I slam down the glass until it cracks up the side, and now the game is about who will still drink from it, who will risk shards in the belly, who will cut up their insides for a pack of Newports. And it's not that I even want the cigarettes. It's just that I am not afraid of blood, which is also part of being a girl. But being the only girl means making yourself lose when you've won too much. So I bounce a coin off the rim of the shot glass and let Johnny slice me open. In 30 minutes, Johnny is dragging me out of the bathroom by my wrists, and I can hear him saying something about blood on the carpet, about a drunk girl in the house who is staining everything, and I think that must mean I'm the champion of quarters. Johnny is the kind of guy who sleeps with a gun, not women. But Johnny is always the one inviting me over for a game of quarters, and sometimes I wonder if this is how Johnny fucks. Like maybe he is the kind of man who only screams when he's underwater or lets me feel how strong his fingers are without actually touching me. Maybe that's why we're all here, even the boys, to let Johnny hold us like a barred window. I work a double one day a week, and on this day, don't answer Johnny's call. By one day a week, I mean two men break in and shoot Johnny in the temple for 2,000 pills, and I am scraping pasta off a businessman's plate into the trash. At some point, I'll tell you why I didn't go to the wake. I guess I never really knew Johnny like that. By that, I mean sober or in a church. When I say I didn't go to the wake, I mean, I drove by his house every day for two years, and the for sale sign never got taken down, like the house would always be Johnny's, like maybe the whole town knew what happened here, like maybe no one could get rid of the blood. Thank you. All right, just a couple more. A few more, not a couple. A couple means two, but I'm probably going to do more than two. All right, uh, I used to play soccer. I was an athlete for, like, many years. Uh, it was, like, going to be the trajectory of my life, and um, that didn't happen. And sometimes that happens. Things change. Um, this is called Fourth Week of Two-A-Days in July. Us girls with all our stuff, our cleats and shin guards and ace bandages and headbands to keep our bangs back, our sports bras and spandex and everything else that preserves the body, the bones, our most promising tool, our expensive sneakers. I got mine at a place called Play It Again Sports, where rich kids sell their one season used Nike cleats with the side laces that claim a purpose they don't actually fulfill. Got long sleeves to wipe the sunscreen that bleeds into our eyes. Got a 15 second water break 10 minutes ago, and now we've got six miles around the golf course. That is is supposed to be the color of money, but around here looks like horse food. Lauren passes me on the second loop, spits, and the wind sprays it in my face like some party bitch blowing mean confetti, and now my view is her blonde ponytail, whipping like a breakneck pendulum. Lauren, who says I smell like piss on a good day, is the only one who broke off. The rest of us are a cloud of bats circling the dead grass. It is three o'clock eight years into the drought, and when Jackie stops to vomit in the ditch, I hang back while she hacks up nothing. 
Next to us, nestled in the dirt, is a syringe and a rubber tie-off, a spoon bent in the shape of a daffodil, black tar burnt to the mouthpiece, scattered like an abandoned highway shrine. I swat her on the back, remind her of the college scholarship, the scouts and the ironed jerseys, all that money waiting for our feet. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's see. All right, so uh, the last section of the book is largely about love, um, or like a lack of it, I suppose. Um, <laughs> Um, I love super hard, and that's something I denied for many years. I was always like, I'm the cool girl. Um, you can fuck multiple people while you're fucking me, but I should be monogamous. That's fine. Like, that was me, right? And, um, and I think I just deny, I think that femme people are often, like, told to make themselves smaller, and, and in turn, I think that's synonymous with loving less, right? And... So for so many years, I was like, I'm not like other girls. Um, I'm like, I'm friends with the boys or whatever. And, and I think only recently, like in the last year, have I fully accepted that I love really hard. Um, I feel like I'm always either in love or heartbroken and never anywhere in between. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I've been writing about that and thinking about that. So this poem is called The Scholar. <clears throat> it's about dating people who are scholars. <laughs> Don't trust these motherfuckers in Ivy League schools, all right? <laughs> Don't trust them. Especially if they make it a goal to go to every Ivy League school that exists. Talk about it. Don't trust them either. <laughs> Especially if they perform humility like it's a part-time job. Don't trust them. Don't trust them. Especially if they have a collection of suits in their closet with matching pocket squares. Don't trust them. All right. It's enough. I might as well just say the motherfucker's name right now. Uh, the Scholar for JB. The house is heavy with sour burning fish. When I leave, my clothes will smell of seared salmon. Sulking men on the train will tidy their backs, twist their necks in my direction, assume my thighs used bait. You know the thing we learn in grade school about cheap girls' bodies, how they carry the sea. I make the train smell like Gowanus, trash river lady, all for you. You are back home writing a book on the kitchen floor. Told me this morning you met someone else. She lives in Europe, but you have more in common. Like religion, your names sound nice together. I ask for my things, you give me a garbage bag. I ask for my coat, you beg me to leave it. It smells like you, you say. The last time we made love, you asked me if I was scared. I think you wanted me to say yes. When we go to bed, all of the women scale the fire escape, perch on the rust, cackle and sing. You can tell how much he loves her by how he sleeps. Not at all, not at all. Not at all. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess I'll read two more. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, who here knows what period underwear is? So I'm not talking about like thinks, the kind that you're meant to bleed in. Um, thinks are like Spotify, and the period underwear I'm talking about is like the mixtape. Like, it's like back, right? Um, I get all you like new people are like growing up with some shit that's like, oh, it's so cool to bleed. Well, when I was growing up, it wasn't fucking cool to bleed your pants, all right? And I spent years bleeding my pants. I still do. It's why these are black on the back, so that if I bleed through, it doesn't really show. 
Um, anyway, I like writing odes to things that I don't particularly love. So this is an ode to my period underwear. I didn't purchase you as such. You grew into the role. Earned your name after the first stain, and admittedly now I am careless with your fabric. No fear of the overflow, as I trust you will not mind another scar, and yes, once you were brand new. Bought in the name of some boy who I wished to see me unmarked and clean as his mother's kitchen counter. Perhaps once you were even called the good pair, which is not to say you are the opposite now, but that you gave new meaning to the phrase. In the way that a good car is often one with six digits in the odometer, isn't that the greatest evolution for something to be good and then to become more good in its thorough use, you, keeper of a thousand not pregnant surprise parties, instigator of the exhale, proof that no matter how many years I have spent here, I will never get the hang of this. And even though I have shoved you to the back of the drawer, strategically folded so that your forever mess was not revealed, I have also reveled in the fossil of you. Yes, you, relic of age 13 and also 23, hoarder of the blot. We all have at least one of you to slide up our winter legs, wiggle in your loose grip, and this too is a kind of ceremony. The choosing of you, I mean, and the washing too. The folding and wearing and washing again, and at last the ruin, the ritual of the spill your national anthem, your ever-changing flag. Yeah. All right, so before I do my last poem, I wanna thank you all so much for coming out here. Um, Minneapolis and St. Paul are cities that have continued to welcome me in really unexpected ways, and I love being here. Every time I'm here, I have so much fun. Um, Sometimes I want to move here. Maybe I will. I don't know. Uh, one day, maybe. Um, but thank you. So thank you for being here. A couple things. I want to thank um, the people at Button Poetry, Sam and Dylan, for, for letting me write this book. Or f I guess y'all didn't let me write this book. Like, I wrote this book. But um, <laughs> you guys, uh, you know, gave, me, gave it a home, and that's really nice. Um, so thank you for doing that, and thank you for being supportive of me uh, and my sensitivities <laughs> throughout this. And uh, thank you to Lissa, my manager, for making sure that I eat and always giving me gum. And um, thank you, oh, yeah, and thank you all for being here uh, and for reading my poems and for enjoying it. And thank you to Reese Witherspoon for being such an underrated actress. Um, <laughs> Um, and quickly, I want to say I tour a lot. I, that's what I do all the time. And so I have a mailing list back there that is like for a, a like little email you can get. And I'll send you like Spotify playlists and like Bed Bath & Beyond coupons. And so like you can sign up if you want to. It's like back there on the table on a laptop. So I was told to mention that. Um, you can go do that. Um, I want to end with this poem uh, because there are... It's, uh, an artist named Tiffany Mallory drew a comic of this poem, and it's so beautiful, and it got turned into a poster, and I love it so much. And this is a poem that I wrote with hopes that one day I would feel the way I do in this poem, and I still don't always. And when I read it, I remind myself that there was a time when I believed I could be this, so I again believe it. Um, and I hope that it works like that for all of you. I think it's important to know that people who are shitty to you do not love you. Um, and I think often we say, this person is shitty to me because they love me. Or this person is shitty to me, but if I do this, that, and the other, they will love me one day. If I make myself this, they'll love me. And that's not true. Um, I think it can be an immediate bruise to the ego to say that. To say, how could, it's like, how could someone not love you? You are remarkable and smart and beautiful. How could someone not love you? And that can hurt really badly to admit that to yourself, but I think you waste a lot less time when you say that and just keep moving. And that doesn't mean move on, you know? You don't have to move on. You can cry every fucking night, you know? But I think it's important to name that and to say that. Uh, I don't always practice that, so I wrote a poem about a universe in which I would. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This is called Alternate Universe in which I am unfazed by the men who do not love me. 
When the businessman shoulder checks me in the airport, I do not apologize. Instead, I write him, oh, fuck, hold on. Sorry, I'm gonna start that poem over. I wanted to say thank you to Huey for bronzing my titties and for giving me a beautiful contour and highlights night. Uh, he did the same thing for Melissa. I didn't wanna like not say that and I was saying it to myself so many times. I was like, give me like, just like work on my chest and he really did. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> I was showing him pictures of Ariana Grande and I was like, this is what I need. And I think like it, the resemblance is almost like uncanny at this point. So <laughs> thank you so much. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not walking side to side, unfortunately. I'm not getting laid at this time in my life, but that's okay. All right. Alternate universe in which I am unfazed by the men who do not love me. When the businessman shoulder checks me in the airport, I do not apologize. Instead, I write him an elegy on the back of a receipt and tuck it in his hand as I pass through the first class cabin. Like a bee, he will die after stinging me. I am 24 and have never cried. Once, a boy told me he doesn't believe in labels, so I embroidered the word chauvinist on the back of his favorite coat. A boy said he liked my hair the other way, so I shaved my head instead of my pussy. While the boy isn't calling back, I learn carpentry, build a desk, write a book at the desk. I taught myself to come from counting ceiling tiles. The boy says he prefers blondes and I steam clean his clothes with bleach. The boy says I am not marriage material and I put gravel in his pepper grinder. The boy says period sex is disgusting and I slaughter a goat in his living room. The boy does not ask if he can choke me, so I pretend to die while he's doing it. My mother says this is not the meaning of unfazed. When the boy says I curse too much to be pretty and I tattoo cunt on my inner lip, my mother calls this being very phased. But left over from the other universe are hours and hours of waiting for him to kiss me. And here, they are just hours. Here, they are a bike ride across Long Island in June. Here, they are a novel read in one sitting. Here, they are arguments about God or a full night's sleep. Here, I hand an hour to the woman crying outside of the bar. I leave one on my best friend's front porch, send my mother two in the mail. I do not slice his tires. I do not burn the photos. I do not write the letter. I do not beg. I do not ask for forgiveness. I do not hold my breath while he finishes. The man tells me he does not love me, and he does not love me. The man tells me who he is, and I listen. I have so much beautiful time. Thank you so much, everybody. You all have a good night. Thank you.